Hello, and welcome to the Plant Engineering Workshop Seminar on API 692 Event Studies. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope that by the end you'll have learned something useful about event studies and the API 692 requirements that are driving the sudden interest in them. I'd like to start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Dwyer, and I currently work at John Crane as an application engineer in the dry gas seal engineering department. I focus on end user applications and retrofits, but in my previous life, I worked on dry gas seal systems. Now this combination of seal and system engineering places me very well to talk about vent studies, as vent studies are something that encompass the seal and the system and the compressor. So you need to sort of be able to be fluent in all of them in order to really understand event study. In this video, I'm going to try and talk about the API 692 requirements surrounding event studies. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the assumptions you make when you're doing event study, how you do event study. And I'm going to try and talk about how to interpret the results of event study sort of the goals of doing event study, and then some mitigations you can make to help alleviate a negative result of event study. But before we do all that, uh, I always like to start off with a little bit of a dry gas seal briefing. So if you're very familiar with dry gas seals, the next few minutes of this video might be a little bit boring for you, but it's always good to make sure that we start out with a similar vocabulary and have a bit of a refresher. Tandem dry gas seals are the most common configuration of gas seal on the market. And for this video, I'm going to focus exclusively on tandem dry gas seals. They make up the vast majority of applications in the field, and they're going to be the most relevant to the largest group. That being said, the things I say are going to be broadly applicable to other gas seal configurations, such as double or single. So if you have one of those applications, I hope this will be useful for you too. One of the big things that API 692 did when it first came out is it standardized some of the vocabulary around dry gas seals. This is a technology that's been out there for 30, 40 years. And over time, there's been a lot of linguistic drift over what people call things. So I, for the purposes of this video, will be using the API 692 definitions. On the screen, I'm showing a photo of a dry gas seal. And there's a couple of key components that I would like to highlight. The first of which are those large red rings in the middle. These rings are called the mating rings. These are the rotating component of the dry gas seal. They are affixed to the shaft, and these are the rings that have those magic spiral grooves on them that everyone's heard so much about. The next most important component there is the primary ring. The primary ring is the stationary ring. It is static and it does not rotate, but it does move axially along with its carrier. And those two rings form the core of the dry gas seal. That's where we achieve that tiny, tiny, tiny one micron sealing gap that helps get the leakages so low. In order to do that, we need a couple of gas streams that are supplied by the gas seal system. Starting on the left, the most important of which is the seal gas supply. This is a cleaned gas that is injected into the seal. About 90% of it flows off and over to the left across that yellow process labyrinth back into the process, while about 10% of it goes across the dry gas seal. This gas stream is there to make sure that none of that dirty process gas gets into the compressor, into the seal, and is nice and clean and dry so that the seal has something good to run on. Stepping over one is the first leakage point for the seal, is the primary vent. This is where the seal gas leakage is going to go. It is usually connected up to a flare system and can have a minor back pressure on it. 
The next is the secondary seal gas supply. Historically, this has also been called the buffer gas supply, uh, but API 692 names it the secondary seal gas supply. This is typically nitrogen that is injected into the outboard stage of a tandem dry gas seal. And what this nitrogen does is it flows across that yellow intermediate labyrinth directly above the outboard stage of the dry gas seal and keeps any leaking process gas from the inboard seal away from the outboard stage and forces it all up the primary vent. This means that your outboard stage is running purely on nitrogen. Now it's worth mentioning here that not every seal has a secondary seal gas supply, but generally most seal manufacturers and API 692 recommends that it be included. Moving over next is the secondary vent. The secondary vent takes the leakage from the secondary seal and is generally left as unrestricted as possible. This is a vent that usually goes directly to atmosphere and should be routed to a safe location. Uh, depending on the process and the conditions, that might just mean it's a hole in the compressor, or it might mean that it's rooted 10 feet in the air away from any personnel at site. And the next side is the separation seal gas supply. This is the separation seal gas. This gas is typically nitrogen that flows in between those two yellow carbon rings on the far right hand side of my diagram. And what this gas does is it ensures that no bearing oil can get into the gas seal. Over here where my pen is marking in red is typically the bearing. And these bearings are full of oil. And oil is very, very bad for dry gas seal. So the separation seal gas supply helps keep the oil away from my dry gas seal. So with that basic primer sort of out of the way, let's talk about vent studies. API 692 states that if specified, a vent study shall be performed in accordance with Annex A. And when you read through the standard and when you look at part one in Annex A, it gives you this big long list of requirements and, and things that need to be done to do event study. But, but what exactly is event study? All event study is, is a model or a series of calculations that tell you what's happening with regards to pressures and flows inside your seal and compressor and system in the event of certain failure conditions. API 692 specifies a number of failure conditions, uh, failure of the primary seal, failure of the secondary seal, failure of the primary seal and the secondary seal. And the vent study is there to help you ensure that if one of these failure conditions does exist inside your machine, you don't end up with a catastrophic result. As a seal manufacturer, I wish I could tell you that dry gas seals never fail, that they're always perfect, but any end user will be able to point to an instance where a dry gas seal has failed. So I would encourage everyone to try and do vent studies to make sure that if a failure does occur at your site, you're prepared and you know what to do. But just knowing why you should do event study isn't the only thing. You need to know how to do event study. Building up the model of event study is a lot like summing up the restrictions or barriers that fluid, in this case gas, is going to have to flow through in order to exit the compressor and end up at your boundary conditions. Now I'm going to talk about boundary conditions later. But what this really means is that you need to have a good understanding of the geometric restrictions that exist around your seal. And you also need an understanding of where the fluid is going to flow. So this means that you need to take into account all of the potential flow restrictions within the seal, the system, and the compressor itself.
Now, as the seal manufacturer, I'm going to start with the seal. And I'm showing a diagram here of a dry gas seal. And what I try to do is highlight all of the res various restrictions that exist within the seal that aren't the dry gas seal itself. For most vent studies, you assume that in whichever failure condition you're modeling, that this blue mating ring and this orange primary ring have just gone. They've vanished. And so then the only restrictions that will be left in, within the seal are the various things that I've, I've highlighted. Now, the first one that I think is useful to talk about are these labyrinth seals that I'm circling now. There are two labyrinths generally found within dry gas seals, an intermediate labyrinth and a process labyrinth. Now, these labyrinth seals do offer a restriction, but it's typically not incredibly significant. Um, a labyrinth seal will not cause a significant pressure drop, but what a labyrinth seal can do is help redirect flow when you do your vent study. And I'll try and talk about that a little bit later, some more. But the labyrinth seals are the first thing that you want to consider. The next sort of big restriction that you generally want to consider is this area underneath the carrier here that I'm circling. Now this again does not offer a terribly significant restriction but it is the most restrictive bit of metal work within the seal and so is, is generally something that you want to consider. A lot of times we'll have customers ask us about potentially making that gap smaller or helping to reduce the overall area in that carrier and that poses a bit of problems for us as a seal manufacturer because the carrier itself has to move backwards and forwards from left to right in this diagram axially along with the shaft. And any close clearance can impede that motion and cause you issues. So while it's important to model it and to understand the restriction that is caused by that close clearance, know that most seal manufacturers are going to be particularly loath to shrink that down even more. The next big restriction that we want to talk about is the porting within the dry gas seal. These are the various ports that connect back out to the compressor annulus and go back out to the system. And they can take the form of slots, as in A, B, C, and D, or they could take the form of holes, as in D and E. Slots generally give you a larger area and create less of a restriction. Holes can generally be a little bit tighter, but it always depends on the slot and the hole. So you need to understand the geometry of those features individually so that you can incorporate them into your model. The last major component I want to talk about is the separation seal. Now, I could go into a whole separate presentation on separation seals and vent studies. But just know that your separation seal here at the back end needs to be considered in your model and definitely needs to be taken into account as it can have a significant impact on the pressures and flows that build up within your seal. Now that we've considered the seal, we need to move on to the compressor. And I'll apologize in advance here. As a seal manufacturer, I unfortunately don't have a good cross-sectional drawing of a compressor that I can give you. But I'd just like you to imagine the restrictions that can be caused by the compressor. And the ones that are relevant to the vent study are the ones that arise from these annuli here. Ports A, B, C, D, and E all have some sort of drilling that comes off of them that goes through the compressor end wall. And when you're doing the vent study, you need to take into account this drilling and the restriction that this drilling provides to the flow. Typically, these drillings are assumed to be unrestricted. And that's generally going to be the case for all non-failure conditions related to dry gas seals. But 
In the event of a seal failure, the flow rates can be quite become quite significant, and consequently the pressure drops and restriction offered by these drillings can also become significant. Additionally, if the drillings take torturous paths, if there are cross drillings with 90 degree turns in them, that can make the restriction all the much greater. And so it's very important that you consider these drillings and the way that the annuli exit the compressor when you do your vent study. So that ties us up for the compressor. The dry gas seal system is probably the most complicated piece of event study. And the reason for that is there are so many different dry gas seal systems out there. I've placed on the screen here a PNID that represents a reasonably rudimental dry gas seal system supplying each of the streams. Port A is the seal gas supply. Port B is the primary vent. Port C is the secondary seal gas supply. Port D is the secondary vent. And port E is the separation seal gas supply. When you're doing a vent study, you need to consider a lot of things about the system. And when you're first setting it up, you don't necessarily know which way the fluid is going to be flowing through the system. You don't know if the pressure developed at port A will be so significant that the seal gas flow will actually not be flowing through port A and will instead reverse itself and try and go back against the regulator. You don't know if the pressure built up in port B is going to be significant enough to open up that PSV in the line and add extra venting. The other thing that this PNID diagram does not capture particularly well that absolutely needs to be considered is the physical layout and the physical piping of the system. Generally in failure conditions, the flow rates observed are quite significant. And this means that the piping losses and the losses experienced in pressure caused by fluid flowing through pipes also become quite significant. Consequently, it's important to not only model the componentry, but also to model the pipework and any bends in the pipework and any potential restrictions that the pipework might cause. All of these things together add up to the complete picture of the vent study. The vent study is not something that can be done just by the system manufacturer. It's not something that can be done just by the compressor manufacturer. It's not something that can just be done by the seal manufacturer. It involves inputs from all three. And it's very important that all three of those parts work together to help alleviate some of the worst outcomes. There are a lot of assumptions that go into any sort of engineering modeling. And the key ones for the vent study are your boundary conditions. So I've already talked about how when we model these failure scenarios for a vent study, you need to consider the primary ring and the mating ring as just having vanished. That represents the worst case scenario. They've disintegrated. As I've drawn on this screen, I've, I've drawn on this screen the what I refer to as the double jeopardy failure scenario, where both the primary ring and the mating ring have of the inboard and outboard stage have simultaneously just disintegrated. I don't view this as a particularly likely scenario, uh, but it is in the API requirements and it's good to illustrate kind of what we're talking about. So then you need to make assumptions about the boundary conditions of your system. One of the first ones that you need to assume is the process pressure indicated on the left there. What is that pressure going to be? Are you going to use settle out pressure? Or are you going to use the operating pressure of the machine. As the gas seal engineer, I would tend to 
use the highest dynamic operating pressure. The main reason for this is that while the dynamic operating pressure might be lower than the settle out pressure, dry gas seals tend not to fail in static conditions. So while a settle out pressure might be higher, might represent a worst case, it might not necessarily be representative of an actual condition that could occur within the machine. So once you've established that first boundary condition, you then have to establish another, which is over here on the bearing and atmospheric pressure side on the far right of my diagram. So this is essentially a P naught, and it is generally assumed to be atmosphere. Most bearings are at atmosphere. They have vents in them that expose them to atmosphere, which makes them at atmospheric pressure. But if, it is, if your particular bearing area isn't, or if maybe you don't have a bearing over here, you have something else, you need to make an assumption about that pressure and consider it a boundary condition before you start doing your modeling and your simulation. The other two pressures that you need to consider are the flare system pressure. So what is port B venting into? Is it a flare? Does that flare have a back pressure? What is that back pressure? And then port D, and is port D going to, what pressure is port D going to be at? The vast majority of port Ds, which is the secondary vent, should be at atmospheric pressure, but every application is different. And so you need to make that assumption about what your particular boundary conditions are going to be for your model. So once you've established that, you can actually start doing your modeling. And that modeling is going to have involve various equations, uh, things like Bernoulli flow equations, choked flow equations, ways to calculate fluids flowing through gaps. Now those equations themselves are non-trivial. I don't really feel that I have the, the time to go into great detail about them here, but if you do a little bit of research, you can find them. You, you can also produce a model like this with a CFD program. A CFD program like ANSYS, uh, ANSYS Fluent, can help you get something that will identify these various pressure regions and these flows, because that's really what you're looking for. You want to have an output that shows you the various pressure regions that build up in your seal as I've identified by these colors in this diagram, and the various flow rates traveling through areas of your seal, as I've identified with my arrows and my you know, Q1, Q2, Q3. Once you have those in hand, and once you understand those and have produced those using all of the geometric restrictions and the system information we've discussed previously, along with your boundary conditions, you can begin to start to interpret your results. The overall goal of performing any sort of modeling or any sort of study in a compressor is to ensure that nothing, that, that you can operate the machine in a, in a safe way. You want to avoid high pressures that cause pipes to burst. You might find that in a certain failure condition, you'd experience a significantly higher pressure than you thought in your primary vent line, and you need to increase the rating of that pipe. You might also discover that during a certain failure condition, your flow rate out your primary or your secondary vent is too high, and you'll fail to meet environmental regulations or even more disastrous, you could create a hazardous condition around the compressor. Generally, the goal in compressor seal and system design is to try and reduce the pressures experienced during a failure as much as possible, which means enabling the gas to escape the compressor as readily as possible and also directing all of the gas that escapes to a safe area. Generally, this means trying to put as much of the flow rate 
up your primary event as possible as compared to your secondary event. And it also means trying to prevent any escape of gas out the bearing area of the compressor, which could lead to process gas potentially existing directly at the compressor case, which is very, very bad. So once you have your vent study results in hand, you can start to look at a couple of modifications you can do to either reduce these pressures or change these flow rates. A vent study really reveals certain opportunities for redesigns. And as the gas seal manufacturer, I'm constantly approached by people who, based on the results of vent studies, want to try and reduce the pressure that is being experienced in either their secondary vent or in their primary vent. And the first thing they want to do is introduce new restrictions within the gas seal. And I don't blame end users for this because it is the easiest thing to do. Unfortunately, the restrictions we can introduce in the gas seal don't tend to be particularly effective at reducing the pressures in these failure scenarios. Adding things like intermediate labyrinths doesn't dramatically reduce the total flow rate out of a compressor. An intermediate labyrinth does dramatically shift the percentage of flow that goes out the primary vent compared to the secondary vent, but it doesn't really have any significant impact on the pressures. Similarly, gaps in the carriers or restricting the primary vent porting can have other really negative consequences. The best place to approach reducing pressures or flow rates that build up in undesirable areas as a result of event study is through the system, through incorporating things like pressure safety devices, through ensuring that your secondary events and your primary events are adequately sized in order to allow a good evacuation of gas. Now, in a retrofit application, this can be prohibitively expensive. Uh, expensive to the point where replacing the gas seal and adding a few more restrictions in it can be the vastly preferred option. But this emphasizes why it's so important that you do event study at the initial design stage of any application. And it's really important that you take the results of that event study seriously. It's much, much easier to add a pressure safety device or to increase the line size of a particular line in your system on the PNID and to order it right from the get-go than it is to years later have to tear out old pipework and put in new piping. So that concludes my presentation. I hope that it was informative and I hope that you learned something about vent studies and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the videos at the Plant Engineering Workshop. Thank you very much for your attention.